Hello everybody and welcome back to Guided Hacking. This is Fred K and today we're going to be taking a look at how threat actors will target other threat actors. And we'll start by looking at this GitHub account. For a bit of context, I was working on a video that will be published off this one that was looking at the communications and what Redline Stealer is. And I wanted to show insights into what the tool looks like on a threat actor side. I came across this GitHub repository and this copy of Redline Stealer. So when downloading it, I noticed some very odd things going on when I was trying to just analyze the file and remove a few things about the stealer, which I didn't want to show in the video so that I didn't help anybody out who wanted to use it maliciously. Within these files, there are some very malicious things and we'll take a look through it. Let's get into it. So once we download the archive from the GitHub account, we unarchive it to find these files. We see the main redline stealer cracked file along with a few other files we have this batch file which is just a firewall command and then going into the libraries we also see a lot more files such as the builder build and stub which are also quite interesting to us but we'll discuss these later what we really want to concentrate on is this main redline stealer cracked binary we can see that it's got a compiler of microsoft visual c++ uh, Microsoft linker and then the overlay and archive is actually a raw archive so you'll see commonly within malware that certain packers and other tools that can modify malware will put everything into a self-extracting raw archive so that it can pack files together and also somewhat obfuscate them let's just unarchive this executable within this folder we see some of the same files they're slightly modified but they're not super interesting but we see two files which are interesting this discord.exe and this discord main panel cracked which is the same binary as the other one but because I've unarchived it, it's got a smaller file size and we can also see a different configuration here. The libraries also are the same. So let's begin by looking at the redline main panel crack.exe and let's open it within dnspy because it's a .NET executable, which we can find out by going on detect it easy. And we see that it's .NET. So we can take this into dnspy and take a look at what may be inside it. First of all, we see some weird name schemes within the assembly and details, such as these random version names, uh, product being Acrobat, copyright being Depression at Moonbeam, and so on. So these, when you see these kind of random assembly descriptions and things like that, if we reference the crypto that I took a look at in one of my previous videos, they have functionalities which will just randomize these. And this is what it somewhat looks like when you randomize them within those kind of tools. If we look within the binary, we see two classes here. We just see the module, which has nothing in it. And then we see a class called loader and it's got the program within it. And within the program class, we see that there is a main function, which is what you will go into when you run the binary and a get resource function. So when we begin reading through this main function, we can already see that it isn't what I would typically expect from a cracked client for malware normally if you went into a crack client you'd see all the code for the client but instead this seems to be some kind of intermediary loader which is somewhat suspect because i don't see why you put that over on top of a cracked piece of malware unless you were using it for something within the functionality of the crack or you're doing something malicious which is very common we can see in the first line that it gets the resources so if we look at the resources at the binary we can see that it's looking for the applied resources propaganda dot that and his propaganda dot that within the next line it gets a base 64 string and i checked this string and it's nothing interesting because what it's really used for is the next for loop here which the bytes of the resources are put into array one and then array two is the base 64 decoded string and when it goes through this for loop it's going to xor with that base 64 decoded string and the byte array. So this is just a XOR decryption function for what's in the resources. Then once that's been decrypted, it will call activator create instance and load from the file that was decrypted from the resources. So our next move would probably be to grab the decrypted sample so that we can analyze it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on the activator line. I'm going to add a breakpoint and I'm going to start the program. We can just click OK on that and wait for it to run and we finish running through it. Because we know that we're looping through the array and XOR decrypting it, the output is put in the array itself. So it overwrites what was in the array. That way we can take the array here and we can click on save 
and I'm just going to put this into my desktop and call it dump.bin. And we can stop the execution of this so we don't actually infect ourselves. Just before I go on to look at dump.bin, I'm just going to quickly point out the fact that there is also other .dat files which may become interesting later, but we'll refer to those later down the line. So let's open the next file in the process called dump.bin, which I just dumped. And within it, we see a DLL. Now, I did just guess that it was a .NET file, but obviously if you hadn't already looked at it, like I have, uh, you would want to use the text it easy and just quickly check what that is. Now we can go onto the worker and we can read through what this code is doing. So we see two strings here to start, our, start us off. These look again like base64 encoded strings because of that double equals padding here. And usually I'll always guess that it's base64 because it's such a common thing for malware writers to use, especially in lower level malware like this is. Then it'll go through a, it'll create a dictionary using these strings, go through the dictionary, deserialize them, add them to a list, and then go through that list and execute them. If we read through, we start to get an indication of what this is. So we see this name here for the function called execute binder. If you've ever looked at a lot of malware tooling, you may have come across binders. Some of you may be wondering, how do you learn malware analysis and how you can do the same as I do in these videos? Well, if you're prepared to put in the hard work and time, then I recommend that you go and check out the amazing content on the guided hacking website. There is an insane amount of technical content specifically regarding reverse engineering. So go check out Guided Hacking as your one-stop shop for all things reverse engineering. So you may be wondering what a binder is and this is what a binder looks like. It will take a legitimate file and a malicious file and then combine the two into a single file. This way, if you're spreading your malware by pretending that it's something that it isn't, you can take a piece of software and then your malware and combine the two so that the software is ran and then the malware is ran in the background. And this is very useful so that the victim doesn't suspect too much. When we continue looking through the malware here, we can see that it would make sense as to why this is being used because the threat actor is spreading a cracked version of Redline, but is also adding their own malware into a malware builder which is somewhat ironic. It's also quite interesting how this threat actor will be targeting other actors. So we should start off by looking at what these base64 strings may be. When I decrypt these two base64 strings, the first one is this redline main panel cracked and then this Windows form application. So like we previously saw, we can see that this is probably the redline cracked client, which when you're downloading the tool, this is what you'd expect to see. And it's got a falcon.dat file and then Windows app form application, which is harbor.dat. Where do these binaries come from? Well, I mentioned earlier that there were more resources in the, in the resources of the first file, and we can use these as a reference. We're not interested in the cracked red line, but we are interested in what this Windows form application is, and it's followed by harbor.dat. We can go in the resources here and we can download that. And I'm just going to right click on it and then go on raw save. I'll just put it on my desktop. We can then go on my desktop, find it, detect it easy, and we can see that it's a .NET binary. So again, we're going back into DNSPY and checking out what this is and probably what it's doing to the system. So we open it and as we saw previously, it's a Windows form application and we can look through it and we find a program file with a bunch more data. Now, I'm not going to go through exactly what everything this is doing because it's a bit bigger and would take some time, but just to give a quick overview, it's going to decrypt this string, this string, it's going to create a web client and download from them, and then it's going to invoke whatever it's downloaded. So instead, I'm gonna quickly show the string decryption. So I'm gonna click an add breakpoint here to get the decrypted string. I'm gonna run until it breaks on this breakpoint. So we can step over this string decryption and we can see that the URL is a URL to Discord. If I copy this value and put it into a bigger display of text, we can see that it's a run PE DLL. So they're going to be implementing run PE to run the next stage of this malware. Then if we step over, we run into an issue here that that file and URL isn't up anymore. But we can't debug to the next string because we still want to find out what this string is. So 
I'm going to show you a quick hack as to how we can get past that. What we're going to do is we're going to take this string and we're going to copy it. Then we're going to rerun the malware. Once we've hit our breakpoint, we're going to step into the string decryption function. We're going to find the value here. I'm going to edit the value. Now, the original value had quotation marks around it, so I'll put those two. And then what we'll do is we'll just hit step out to finish this function and step out of it. And then we can step over again to get our decrypted string. And we can see an IP here with a port and an executable. Then it'll call ASPNet net compiler, so on and so forth, and invoke whatever this binary is. Funnily enough, when I first looked at this, this binary is redline. So to summarize what the threat actor is doing here, is that they are spreading this redline main panel cracked, which is in fact a real version of redline if I run it. And this client does function to the best of my knowledge, but in the background, the person that runs it will also get infected with the access redline. If you enjoyed this video, a like would help a lot and subscribe to be notified of future uploads. If you haven't already, check out guidedhacking.com for a step-by-step -step introduction to game hacking and an ever-growing catalog of content. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.